Thank you very, very much for coming. We are so I am going to do a 21 second introduction of Teresa Tomlinson, not because I couldn't talk for about 20 minutes about her, but because I don't think people came to hear me. <laughs> so uh, let me just say that we had begun to hear more and more about Teresa, and then um, the next thing that happened is that we heard she had, ha she had hired as a campaign manager the person that uh, Pat and I think is probably the best campaign manager in Georgia. Yes. <laughs> Kendra Cotton Davenport. Um, and then we went, several of us went to um, an East, the Eastern Hub Dems uh, meeting about two or three months ago and heard her speak and looked at each other and said, oh my, <laughs> she's the real deal. So please join me in welcoming two-time mayor of Columbus, which is not only an extremely large city but also a majority minority city. Um, and candidate for you as Senator from Georgia. Yeah. Well, Becky and Pat, thank you so much for opening up your homes. I didn't know what to expect on a Sunday afternoon, but this is tremendous. And you have a great name, Necessary Trouble. Yes. Yeah. So, so let's get in some. <laughs> so let's get into some. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Becky mentioned uh, Kendra Cotton, who may drop in. She's, she's working on a little project right now, but she knows we're here. She may just swing by. And Kevin Dan's in the back, uh, who is such a big helper. Yesterday, we kicked off our statewide campaign headquarters in Columbus, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, well over 100 people. A marching band came. We had a choir. It was tremendous. So if you're on social media, check it out. Uh, we're going to have and do have now a, um, a, a satellite office here in Atlanta on DeKalb Avenue in the Candler Park area. Uh, but we're going to have a big retail front, too, probably right after the first of the year. So keep your eyes open for that. But again, it's so fantastic to be here, to feel your energy. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Several people said, how are you holding up? And I said, well, actually, it, this is so exhilarating for me, running for office. As many of you know, I've been in Georgia Democratic politics for 30 years. I never thought I would be running for anything. I was the one writing checks, holding groups like this, uh, events for other people, uh, sometimes helping run their campaigns, um, you know, like I said, bundling money, uh, which is ever so important when you're running in big, important races. Uh, but I never thought I would uh, be the candidate. And so being out here and getting to feel the energy of people all across Georgia, this is not just going on in Atlanta. I want you to know that. And so we're going to talk about that. And if I, you all have additional questions, I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions. But you need to know that there has been a seismic change in Georgia politics. We all remember when we were a one-party Democratic state, and we all remember, of course, when we were a one-party Republican state, and we are firmly a two-party state. And people hardly know what to do with themselves. I mean, seriously. Uh, they're, they're so confused about the choice. But, uh, but we're taking it to them. Uh, we've got a powerful message. And they're really uh, feeling somewhat liberated and empowered with finally having a choice uh, in, in this new era of, of Georgia. So know that we need to get rid of the myth that Georgia is some ruby red state. Frankly, I don't think we ever were that ruby red, but we need to know that in, in 2016, when we were gut punched with learning that Donald Trump was gonna be the president of the United States, we missed a couple of tidbits. And that is, Donald Trump only won Georgia with 51.5% of the vote. Hillary Clinton lost this state with only 5% of the vote. Now, that's not a ruby red state. And, and then, of course, we had the tremendous transformation of 2018 with leadership of Stacey Abrams and so many folks like you all here that just took to the streets, <coughs> insisted that Georgia move forward. And we came within 55,000 votes of electing the first woman African-American uh, <laughs> governor, uh, governor uh, in the United States of America. I mean, Georgia, folks, <laughs> Georgia, yeah. Yeah. came within 55,000 votes of having the first African-American woman governor. And so things are 
bright. You can see on the horizon a victory for a new day and for better government. But what the, the task is before us is we have to harvest this legacy that we have been handed by 2018. Yes. We, we have to build on this. And so we're going to have to do everything that we learned to do right in 2016, <laughs> everything we know we did right in 2018, and we're going to have to go one step forward, one step forward. And that's what this candidacy is all about. Because if you read the AJC today, uh, particularly online, uh, I gave a speech yesterday and I said, if you run a formidable woman from outside of Metro Atlanta with good name recognition and reputation in Central and South Georgia where we can cut the margins of the ruby red rural Republican strategy, David Perdue cannot win this race. <laughs> in this book is we have got to go where I'm not chasing people in MAGA hats don't don't misinterpret what I am saying there are people in central and south Georgia who, who know that government is the framework in which they live their most prosperous life who understand and share the belief that that we believe that the United States government is the greatest civic invention mankind has ever known that they know that government touches their life every single day because the school district's the largest employer in their county. Yeah. Or it's the army base two, two counties over. They know because they have to travel through three or four counties to get to the first open hospital to get their care because, because the state did not expand Medicaid. They understand how government touches their life. They're farmers and they depend on subsidies and aid and counsel from both the state and the federal government. And, and we have just, as Democrats, have, have really ceded a lot of ground in Central and South Georgia to the Republicans. We just felt that victory could be had by staying in these urbanized, highly densely populated areas of, of Columbus, Georgia, of Atlanta, Macon, and Savannah, and we would run the tables in those areas and the population vote would be too much. And so indeed, when we have elections, you know, you go to bed at 10.30 at night and the deluge of votes have come in and we're winning by 200,000 votes and you sleep like a baby. <laughs> and then you wake up in the morning, we've lost by 55,000 votes and you think, how did that happen? Well, as those vote totals were coming in from Tift County and Crisp County and Dooley County, Grady County, all these counties, you think, where is that? And they're coming in 19,000 votes, 69,000 votes and then they squeak past us. And so when I'm talking about the next chapter in the 2018 legacy, know, know that what I'm saying is there are people out there who are progressives. There are people out there who vote Democratic for their sheriff in, in their, in their uh, non-Metro Atlanta County. We can get those votes. We've just never tried. We lost seven counties in Central Georgia that we never lose in midterm elections, and we lost them in 2018. So we had all of these tremendous victories, all of these things we did right. We won those seven counties. Things would have been different. So, so, so we can't make any mis mistakes. We have got to take every single opportunity, and that's what this candidacy is all about. So let me tell you a little bit about myself and how I come to run and, and, and what my basic philosophies are. Uh, I grew up here in Atlanta. I went to Shambly High School. I lived in DeKalb County. My parents are still over in the house I grew up in off of Shambly Dunwoody Road, right at the intersection of 285. If you know where Georgetown Shopping Center is, that's, that's right there where we live. And so I went to Emory University Law School and then actually practiced law in Atlanta for several years and then was transferred temporarily to Columbus, Georgia 24 years ago <laughs> where I married my husband and he is actually from Columbus. Um, but you need to know, I, I say in my literature, I'm an eighth generation Georgian. And before you go thinking that that has something to do with some mythical culture you read about in a romantic novel somewhere, you need to understand that, unfortunately, uh, seven of those eight generations were ranked rural poverty. Uh, I come from a long line of day labor timber cutters and sharecroppers. So my grandfather had a third grade education. My grandmother had an eighth grade education. So she taught him how to read and write. They had seven kids they could not feed. So my mom and her younger brother, Jimmy, actually were raised by her aunt. 
And uh, my mom uh, graduated, or did not graduate from high school. She left high school at 16, married my dad, who was 19, and in the Air Force. And she went to care for his elderly, disabled parents, because back then, that's the way you did it. There weren't a lot, of other, a lot of other options. But if it hadn't been for my grandfather, who finally got a job at the Swift Meat Packing Plant, a union job, mm -hmm. they, they wouldn't have been able to even begin to claw their way out of pocket. And because my mom never received a formal education, she worked in meat departments, including the one at Georgetown Shopping <laughs> Center there for Kroger and A&P and, and other stores around the state. And so she was a, a proud member, 35-year member of the uh, United Food and Commercial Workers Union, the, the uh, Meat Cutters Union. And uh, here, my brilliant, beautiful mom, who had she received a formal education, we would have already had a uh, woman president. <laughs> But it was, it was because this nation used to celebrate the middle class. Mm -hmm. They used to celebrate the policies that allowed people to advance themselves out of poverty. It allowed them access to their most prosperous life and to the middle class. And my sister and I were beneficiaries of that. It's because my mom was able to supplement our family income with those union wages, those livable wages, that my sister and I were able to go to college, that I was able to go to law school, and that I stand before you as a candidate for the United States Senate. And so I want you to know that I bring that perspective uh, to this particular race. I understand the importance of government. I'm also able to go into those central and south Georgia counties where my mom grew up, where I still have family scattered all over places you've never heard of. Doe Run, Pavo, uh, all kinds, Parrot, all kinds of places. Um, and, and some of those folks didn't make it out. You know, they didn't make it out of the generational poverty. Uh, I understand that life journey, and I can speak authentically and with great respect to the journey of the lives of people that live in all regions of Georgia. And so when I talk about, um, you know, cutting these, these margins and, and shaving these margins in Central and South Georgia, I, I really can't do that. I, I really can't. I want, I want to tell you just a couple quick stories. We did a South Georgia tour, and uh, and we went through several of the counties where farmers have been hardest hit by the tariffs and the incompetent response to the Hurricane Michael uh, in, in October of 2018. And we had a, um, a farmer throw us a fundraiser. And when I was leaving, a gentleman said, um, Teresa, I think that's the first fundraiser farmers held for a Democrat in Thomas County in over 20 years. <laughs> and I said, I, I bet that's right. And the day before, the reason why that was so poignant to me is because the day before I had gone to the Georgia Peanut Growers Association ribbon cutting for a new processing plant they had there. And I was probably 15 uh, people deep into shaking hands at, with about 150 farmers and associates of farmers there when Gary Black, the agricultural commissioner of Georgia, Republican walked in, I thought we were going to have to resuscitate him. <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't seen a Democrat out there shaking hands for, for any race, and I don't know how long. But that, those are our folks. They need good government, and we will not abandon them. And we, will, we don't have to flip some 80% red county to blue. We just got to shave the margin. And I'm telling you, you start to see Tiff County and Crisp County coming in, it's 77% and 75%. You hop in your car and you head to Columbus, Georgia, where we are having the biggest victory party <laughs> you have ever seen. <laughs> so it's not necessary to move these mountains. We need to just make incremental change in some of these ruby red counties. So, so let, let me tell you a few other things. I started out as a lawyer. Um, specializing in complex litigation. The reason why I was transferred to Columbus is because in our firm back in that day, it didn't matter where we actually lived because as long as we could make it to the Atlanta airport, our practice was national. I practiced in federal courts in, in Minneapolis and Boston and Dallas and Mississippi, all, all over the country. Um, I specialized in a, a particular niche of complex litigation. Uh, basically, I got those cases where you had to turn a train around. Uh, somehow. So I sued the largest chemical conglomerate in the world because they created a defective product that not only uh, killed farmers' uh, crops but sterilized their ground, their soil. Uh, then, of course, I had the opportunity to represent 
uh, families who have been tragically impacted uh, by the um, crash of the value jet, um, crash in 1996 in the Florida Everglades, and also um, sued the 15 largest home loan mortgage lenders in the country in 15 separate class actions um, because they were jacking up people's interest rates, um, selling them a bill of goods, and then taking a kickback um, as a result of the inflated the value on the inflated interest rate. And so, you know, I learned some things from doing that, uh, from the sort of David and Goliath um, matchup I seem to always find myself in, and that is I learned how to solve the seemingly unsolvable, because the odds were always against us. And I learned how to pull victory from the jaws of defeat. And I also learned that in order to get justice, sometimes you have to tug the tail of a tiger, but you damn well better know how to, uh, how to deal with ramifications of having done so. And so I took those skills into being mayor of Columbus, Georgia, where we were going through a transformational time, as Becky said. We were transitioning to being a minority-majority community, a majority black community, but our power structure didn't look like that. It did not reflect the individuals. It was older and whiter and, and more conservative, if you will. Good people, but they didn't reflect the citizenry. And so I ran on race, poverty, and blight. And every polit political pundit said, I was going to lose because one, no white woman needed to be talking about race, and two, everything I was talking about did not fit on a bumper sticker. But the truth was that people were hungry for leadership. They wanted ideas of how we were going to transition to our future. They wanted to know somebody had the strength of courage to talk about very difficult things before all different kinds of crowds. We had 44 debates in a four-way open seat race. And I ended up winning with 68% of the vote. Wow. I ran in the, the runoff with an African-American minister of a mega church whose dad had been an icon of the of Columbus, Georgia community. And it wasn't because they didn't like him. Uh, it was just because they realized it was a very serious time for very serious people. And, and frankly, much like what we're going through today. And they wanted a steady hand on the wheel uh, to navigate this 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 new journey that we were on as a community. That's why I won. And uh, and then um, because some people didn't like the change, we actually did change the power structure in Columbus, Georgia. But the executive vice president of the Chamber of Commerce resigned his position to run against me in my reelection effort, and uh, we won with 63 percent of the vote, making me the first mayor to be reelected in a contested race in Columbus, Georgia since 1971. Wow. Columbus, Georgia loves to throw their mayors out. <laughs> but, but we had a great run. We reduced crime by 42 percent. We reduced homelessness by 40 percent. I've actually solved a public pension that was failing. When I came in, our, our public pension was at 74 percent funded. The day I left, it was over 96 percent funded. And we maintained the defined benefit plan, which is the gold standard. So I, I tell you that because I want you to know that I know how to govern and govern well. And, and, and I am a stickler for leadership. In fact, the chief of police called me one day and he said, is there any third rail of Columbus, Georgia politics that you're not going to touch? I said, no. no. Because that's what leaders do. And so, you know, when you're talking about what kind of candidate do you want to put up against David Perdue, I want you to know about the very tough and controversial issues I took head on because those are the ones you have to take head on if you're going to make transformational change. And I also want you to know that in addition to being mayor, which in Columbus, mayor, mayors are different in all of the 500 and, 528 cities have mayors in the state of Georgia. <laughs> and, and they all have, some are figureheads, and some, and only a few really are, are like Columbus, which is a consolidated government where we, I was in charge of both the city and the county government. I was the chief elected officer, so the city manager and city attorney reported to the mayor, not to the council, which is highly unusual. I was also public safety director, I was also head of Homeland Security, and I hold a national security secret clearance with the Department of Defense because I was the chief liaison with Fort Benning, which is the fifth largest military training base in the world. So I can stand on a debate stage with David Perdue and in fact be more qualified to hold that <coughs> Senate Armed Services seat for the state of Georgia than he was. When he was we accomplished and, and the things I had the opportunity to, to participate in when I was, um, it was a lawyer, um, which was high level 
very difficult problem solving because I know that we can have universal health care for all people and, and provide um, a, a, a access to affordable health care during the complete transect of people's lives from, from cradle to grave. I know that we can amend the Voting Rights Act to apply to all 50 states because every citizen is entitled to one person, one vote. It ain't that hard, okay? Uh, I know that we can begin to respect women as human beings and therefore give them basic human rights to their own bodily autonomy. I have a record on that going back 30 years from the time I knew what and the importance of reproductive health was all about. I've been speaking about it and my message has been completely consistent. Uh, and, uh, and I know that we have a crisis on our hands with climate change. And I can tell you, we're already paying for it. So people can stop complaining about what they think the quote Green New Deal or any other bold idea might cost us because we're already paying for the effect. We might as well be paying to, to limit and stop the climate change and not just pick up the pieces after the disastrous impact of it. So, let me close by telling you a couple of quick things. David Perdue is vulnerable. He's vulnerable because he has failed Georgia. He said he was going to go up and, uh, and reform our budget and, and end our budget deficit. Well, the budget deficit is now $1 trillion. It's three times more than it would have been had David Perdue and his ideological ilk never shown up. Now, the Office of Management Budget tells us that, not some Democratic operative. That's the Office of Management and Budget. He has enabled, co-piloted, as he says, and influenced, as he says, this president to declare tariff wars on our own farmers. Farmer suicides are up in the state of Georgia. They have been devastating down there. I had one farmer ask me in that fundraiser I was telling you about, he said, Teresa, we're dying down here. And we're dying down here. What can we do to get some attention? I said, I just gotta be honest with you. They believe that you will line up and vote for them no matter what the offense and you show them that you believe this is a two-party state and you will get more love and attention and respect than you could ever imagine. And, and they're beginning to hear that. And again, I'm, we're not chasing people in MAGA hats, but we're giving people the opportunity that want better government, that, that know they've been had by this, by this administration and are looking for an option. So, so um, between the tariff wars and the incompetent handling of the Hurricane Michael relief, um, and, and frankly, the, the erratic behavior of this administration that has even harmed uh, health care workers, uh, has harmed uh, bankers and financiers in Atlanta who wake up to find out, wait, we, we're declaring tariff wars on Mexico? I mean, what, what's that going to do uh, to the investments we've made in the Kia plant at West Point? Uh, you know, they're sick of it. The biggest single issue in this election is instability. People are exhausted with the instability whether it's because they're, they're scared to death of losing their health care because of pre-existing conditions, whether it's because they're scared to death what might befall their daughters because they don't have access to reproductive health care. You know, just pick any number of reasons that people are exhausted. They want to go back to the day of taking government for granted. <laughs> and in order to do that, they're going to have to have a steady, stable hand on the wheel. So this is important business, folks. 2020 is, without a doubt, the most important election of our lifetimes. And we're going to have to field a candidate to stand up against David Perdue that is formidable and can get this done. So as my campaign manager says, this is a campaign for grown folk. We got ourselves a strategy. We got ourselves one hell of a team that knows how to win their professionals, and we're getting it done every single day. And I submit to you that we have ourselves a candidate that can do it. One, because I have won hard scrabbled elections. I have governed, I have governed well, and I have a particular political profile that David Perdue cannot beat. And that's why I need to be your nominee for the 2020 election. Yeah. some questions. Are you ready to win? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, let's take some questions. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really interested in how you lower the homelessness rate. Yes, it was actually, um, and it's something, I'll, I'll tell you, hit the high points, and if you want to talk afterwards, we can certainly do that. 
Um, a couple of things. We, um, we were a part of a study of um, zero 2016. And it was to get homelessness to what they call a, a net zero, where we had homes for everybody, you know, and put, had put most people in or under roofs, if you will. And so it believes in housing first. So we don't require people to get clean. Uh, we don't require them to uh, reach a certain level of mental stability. And we didn't require them to uh, ascribe to any particular religion, okay? We just would put them in a, in a home a house, a unit of some sort. So housing first was the first thing we did right. Um, the second thing that we did, uh, we had a, underneath our United Way, we had a group called Home for Good. That's the, the city funded that we created my first year in, in office, the city council supported that. It had come as a recommendation from a task force that we had to have someone who woke up every single morning doing nothing but thinking about reducing homelessness. And so that helped us tremendously so we could have some continuity and and persistence and consistency um, in our effort. And probably the greatest thing that we did, um, it was fairly controversial at the time, but we stopped, we did not outlaw, but we stopped through um, just sort of public pressure, public feedings. We bought the city and um, it through, had a grant, a partner with a grant, and we bought a church that had a huge commercial kitchen. And they had, gone out further north and they had left this facility. And so what we did was we encouraged all churches, because usually the homeless, feeding the homeless is one of their most successful missions. And so they don't want to stop the public feeding because that's how they get a lot of kids interested, a lot of volunteers. And But we had somebody who was hit by a car trying to cross the street to get to a public feeding. We had, you know, inevitably, um, people who were not trained coming into close contact with people suffering from mental disabilities, which is why they were homeless, and um, you know issues. And so we had people, uh, homeless folks, arrested because people had called the police on them because they grabbed them, touched them, you know, whatever. And so we thought we, we need to get a handle on this. And so we had churches sign up to take the commercial. They could, they could, if they wanted to go to McDonald's and bring it in, they could, or they could make it there. It didn't, we didn't care how they did it, but we wanted their public feeding to take place in this uh, former church facility in the public kitchen. And then what we did was we brought in the um, wraparound services that folks need who are experiencing homelessness and put them, put offices in that former church facility. And so the feeding actually became a place where we began the relationship with them. And so when there were moments of lucidity or moments of sobriety, we were able to capture that um, because they had a relationship with the folks who were there that they experienced and got to know while they were there for the breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And so it was a wonderful partnership, and that's what it, it, we actually reduced veterans' homelessness by 95%. We, we are at what they call... Uh, net zero for veterans homelessness, meaning every single veteran homeless person in Columbus, Georgia is, is under a roof. And if there are any out there right now that they are either newly into the system or we just haven't yet been able to reach them, but we have a place for them and the wraparound services for them. So I can explain a little bit more, but it's kind of that three prong approach. Yeah. Yes. Teresa, there is every once in a while an article that shows up um, related to work camps. Yes, thank Can you. Can you speak to that? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Columbus, uh, the state of Georgia has work camps as part of its correction system. It's an outdated uh, 20th century uh, concept. It's actually um, for just first-time offenders, low-grade felony offenders. They call them, the state calls them trustees. And um, they can't be gang members, they can't have gang tattoos and all this. They, like I said, low grade felony, first time offender usually um, type folks. And so the state uh, puts them in work camps. There's two here in Atlanta, um, and then there's several just all throughout the state. Well, the largest one is in Columbus, Georgia. So when uh, the state runs them, uh, but the mayor, the, the public safety director in Columbus actually um, appoints all of the people that run the prison. So I appoint the uh, warden, the warden reports direct to me. So when I came in, literally the first couple of months, I was like, okay, now wait a minute. Uh, this place was, it was hugely dysfunctional. And so if you go and Google, you will see all these very dramatic um, articles about me utilizing a little known jurisdiction 
and taking over the Muskogee County Prison. Uh, and I replaced the, sh the warden and replaced the leadership with all new leadership. And we began through that process then transforming that, that 20th century work camp into a rehabilitation and work study camp. And so we ended up providing the most GED graduates of any work camp in the state of Georgia. We provided soft skills training for hundreds and hundreds of folks that came through there. Um, and gave them certificates. And then we partnered with, um, with Columbus Tech and got them certificates for those who, because if you don't, are not familiar with how work camps um, function, you field them every day to, to work on state property and also county property. So it can just be mowing lawns. It can be working uh, with the garbage pickup, uh, but it can also be working on carpentry, painting, um, plumbing, and electrical work. And so what we would do is if they were working in electrical, part, you know, carpentry and so forth, we actually converted those then to um, apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. And so they would get certificates from Columbus Tech for having mm -hmm. apprenticed so they could use it to get a job. Mm -hmm. Then I banned the box uh, in Columbus and we began to hire um, our own prisoners when they got out. So, um, and particularly in the, um, uh, with the garbage facilities because there's a lot of heavy complicated equipment uh, with the compressors and things that they use there that these guys have been trained on why not hire them right and so a lot of times people that don't know and didn't delve uh, you know it's politics after all so not everybody's for me and so, um, <laughs> and so somebody came across it there was a work camp and they were like we got her. you know she was the head of a work camp this is going to be we're going to, you know, and they had no idea that I had reformed the work camp. And, but I actually wrote a paper uh, for Daily Cause, which I can share with you, maybe you can share with the group, which says if, if we would use this idea that we were able to do in Columbus, Georgia, we could transform the work camp system of Georgia to the 21st century and actually use these folks who are the most likely to have their lives transitioned, you know, and, 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 and um, not be prone to recidivism um, through this type of new way of thinking. And it's a very little tweak, if you will. They're already doing the work. Why not give them credit and certificates and lift them up and allow them to be hired, not just by the, the county and the city, but by the state, by any county. I mean, we could do that. I mean, it would just be such a wonderful program. The other thing is private institutions, um, the state pays private prisons $44 per prisoner per day. They pay for public prisons, like this work camp, $22 per prisoner per day. So if we got rid of private <coughs> prisons, yes. we could use all that money uh, to convert all of these work camps into truly awesome rehabilitation and, and training facilities. So thank you very much. And, and I will get you, Kevin, if you'll make a note, we'll... Yes. Get you that. Okay, if you'll get it to everybody, that'd be wonderful. I think somebody had one. Yes, ma'am. I had a question. As senator of the state, yes. uh, besides the work camp mm -hmm. issue you just discussed, yes. what are some key issues you think Georgia needs to address, and what would be your position to address? Them? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, where to start, but let me just, <laughs> let me just jump three. in. Give me three. What, okay, three. Okay, um, I would say, first of all, uh, Medicaid. Right now we consider that to be a state issue, right? There were 17 states. The federal government, the centralized federal government determined that Medicaid should be expanded to 138% of the poverty level, right? That people at that level should be entitled to Medicaid. And 17 states said U.S. citizens in our state can't have that. And, and we stood down for it. The reason is because of the way the law is written. And so I submit to you, we need to redo our Medicaid legislation so the federal government, federal government's already paying 90 cents on the dollar, right? Let's just take the whole 100 cents and mandate if you're a United States citizen, by God, you're going to get Medicaid at your 138%. No state can deny a United States citizen just because they live in there. They do that with Medicare. They don't come down and say, well, you can't, uh, Georgia ain't going to have Medicare. They don't do that, right? So I would say, one, let's change the way we're dealing with Medicaid so that just because you're at the lower end of the income level that states can somehow leave you out high and dry. Um, the, I talked about um, expanding the, voter rights, the Voting Rights Act. 
um, to all 50 states because we know there's people who are being marginalized in North Dakota and the Southwest states. It's Native American Indians in North Dakota. You know, it don't matter the, the, where they live. It's not right. And we've got to bring back preclearance. Um, you know, and I will tell you, uh, yeah, preclearance for everybody. And, and, and um, you know, I've already talked a little bit about Medicaid, but I do believe in universal health care and have some very specific plans for that. I, I will say, I was talking with somebody, uh, I said that I have 14 position papers published and online. So if I don't talk about your specific passion, know that I've written it down because there's going to be no <coughs> Teresa Tomlinson tacking to the right or the left or the middle or whatever it is that they think politicians are supposed to do because I've been speaking out on these issues for decades. You know, it's not like I'm... I'm, I'm always open-minded, but I ain't going to change my basic belief about certain policies. Um, you know, the last thing, I, you could talk about so much, but the last thing I'd say that maybe a lot of people haven't talked about, because I talk about climate change, and I talk about responsible gun ownership, but I think you hear a lot about that because um, that's banning magazines and banning automatic weapons, and, and I talk about that from the standpoint of having been public safety director, in addition to common sense leadership because we've got to give our law enforcement officers um, a fighting chance to protect and serve, you know, and, and with weapons of war, you know, and there's a lot of things on there that I talk beyond the common talking points of universal background checks, like funding the ATF and getting ourselves a national registry. It's ridiculous that we can't solve crimes and we can't track people who are trafficking in guns because there's some weird conspiracy theory that if we have a, a federal registry somehow that that's going to lead to gun, gun confiscation. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. We, we, we have the data, um, we have the techniques, and we need to allow our law enforcement officers access to that type of information. So, yeah. It's so much more. Go check out the 14 papers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what else? Yes, sir. Yeah. How are you? What, what's the mechanism you're going to try to reach out to uh, rural Georgia? Out, mm -hmm. out to the, the rural counties and so on. What, I mean, are you going to send literature to them? I know you, mm -hmm. you can't visit everybody all the time. What, what well, is... a, a couple things, um, because you're kind of talking about brass tacks. So let me talk about something and get down to brass tacks. Um, I've been all throughout those counties for years now, because as mayor of Columbus, Georgia, I speak at the Kiwanis Club and the Women's Day. And so I've, I've been reaching out to those counties through Hub City mayor efforts and things anyway, but long before I ever thought about running for office. So I, a lot of, I, when I said I have name recognition and reputation in those 90 counties of Central and South Georgia, I do. So it's not like I'm a completely unknown quantity to most of the people in that, that area. There is already some maybe perhaps vague, but relationship in, in most all of those counties. But when you get down to the brass tax, which is, and, and we are, by the way, going and have been already to many, many of those counties. When you get down to brass tax, it's kind of back to the future because there's not broadband in a lot of those areas. Uh, there's also not permeating media markets like there are in Atlanta. You can just raise a lot of money in Atlanta and you can get on TV or radio and it's, that's it. I mean, you really don't have to do much else. And at least that's been the heretofore the way of doing things. Um, so it's back to the future with billboards, robocalls, um, uh, you know, rural radio, and mailers and things of that nature. And, and wor word of mouth. So I do a lot of this, a lot of this in rural uh, areas or non-metro Atlanta areas. Some of them are pretty good size. They're just outside of metro Atlanta. So. Yeah, I think you, it seemed like there was somebody else, but yes, there you go. Um, one of the things that we do pretty well is talk about um, mm -hmm. voter registration yes. and try to get, you know, out there in the field in certain areas uh, to make sure everybody gets a vote. Yeah. Before we get to voting rights legislation mm -hmm. and doing things, you know, at, at the national level, what can we do here locally at the grassroots yes. level mm -hmm. do you see us um, in in voter registration yes I think there's been a little bit of a change in, in what where our time could be best spent actually uh, since 2018 one with the mandatory registration now when you go to get a license you're automatically registered unless you opt out that's helped our registration efforts we still have to keep on it don't get me wrong and then there's a lot of people out there that need to be re-registered because they're felons who've now completed their time and so on and so forth um, however 
uh, we, I think our biggest, most pressing issue with registering voters is to get these lists of people being purged. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Because we know at least at least the most conservative estimate is that 25% of them do not belong on that yeah, list. Yeah. So God knows what the true number is. Mm -hmm. And so we have got to get, and I will tell you, even when I'm in you know, smaller counties like White County and Peach County, when you go to their Democratic Party meeting, they have a little bit of business before you get to speak. And they're always like, okay, we got the list this month from the, we're going to divide it up. And, and so they're, they're hustling. Now their, their list isn't going to look like DeKalb County's list. But they're splitting it up and saying, you go get these folks, and you know, Ed, go tell them he's on the list and get them in, you know. And so that's, that's the <coughs> new way, is to fight this purging by getting these lists. You know, they just have, have now put online those 314,000 or whatever it was. And you can, you can segment those by county. Go get them. <coughs> You know, and, and take yours, and, and, and I'm sure if you can segment them by county, you may be able to segment them by street names and, you know, that type of thing. And I would say that would be a fabulous effort for any activist group, is to call those individuals, go knock on their doors and say, did you know? And, and you know, one of the reasons why the purging is so insidious, um, the, the purging related to if you have not voted and we sent you a postcard and you didn't respond, is that um, if you've ever lived in a community where there is a challenging level of poverty, you know that um, people who live at the poverty level, just over the poverty level, um, are very transient. They, they only live places six months at the most. And that's challenging for the school system and all sorts of things, but it's particularly challenging for these voter registration contacts because they, they probably lived in two or three places by the time you're sending them postcards about whether or not you want to you know, update their files. Um, and it assumes, and I love it, I heard the other day, they were saying, so all you gotta do is go to www. You know, yeah. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and it's, just, it's just crazy the disconnect and disrespect for other people's lives. And so I think if we wanna help, we can really help in that way. Getting out and letting them know they're on the list and getting them re-registered. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> with, when you're when you're out speaking with groups in more rural areas mm -hmm. that maybe are more Republican yes. leaning, mm -hmm. what's the biggest pushback that you're getting in terms of issues? Mm -hmm. You know, I will tell you um, that people. I, I said before they're very hungry for leadership, <coughs> and so they are listening. So it's not the angry crowds that I'm used to just because that's the way it has been for at least two decades. Uh, the people come all angry and wanting to fight. It's more a desperation of, I'll try anything at this point. I'm listening to see how reasonable you are and so on and so forth. But some issues that do come up because they're struggling to reconcile how they've always felt about it particular issue in a particular party with what they might be able to do in the future. It's usually abortion and guns. Mm -hmm. And so they want to make sure, so I, I usually say, which is frankly the way I feel about it, so it doesn't, it's not a stretch for me. Um, I think the biggest thing is, let me say first, the biggest thing is that you're authentic when you go there and you don't give them any BS. Um, you tell them what you really think because they know if you're lying to them or not, if you're trying to equivocate, if you're trying to milk toast your political positions to be pablum, to be more palatable, they know you're just giving them a line of bull. And so you need to, it's okay if they disagree with you um, on a particular issue, but they want to know you have the guts to tell them what you think. So to answer your question about guns, I, I usually say um, that we can have reasonable gun laws with, uh, and still respect the Second Amendment, uh, that I don't support gun confiscation, I don't support mandatory buybacks, I support uh, voluntary buy buybacks, because once, once you have outlawed the manufacturing of semi-automatic rifles and then outlawed the transfer of them, you can't do anything with them but sell them back. You can keep them in the closet, you can sell them back. I think legally there's there's too much trouble. We would just be wrapped around the axle for 15 or 20 years without any meaningful solution if we went to mandatory buybacks. So I'm honest about that, and they may quibble with it a little bit, but they appreciate the fact that I tell them we're stopping semi-automatic weapons and extended magazine clips, and we're going to. And then I talk about the fact that um, you know people in rural Georgia don't want to be shot 
while they're worshiping either. And they don't want their grandkids shot in, in nursery school or elementary school. And, and I can tell you there's a real change because they talk all the time now about how they are reasonable, responsible gun owners. Mm -hmm. And you used to never hear that. So now they're separating themselves from the irresponsible mm -hmm. legislation mm -hmm. of, the, of the lobbyists, the gun lobbyists and gun manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And that they're reasonable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that is a very good sign. When it comes to women's reproductive health, it's usually because it's... Um, they have a, a, a faith-based position they're coming from. And so I usually tell them that I, too, have a faith-based uh, position that I come to on that. And I explain to them that my personal faith tradition provides that uh, women um, have been divinely, divinely decreed to, to carry pregnancy within the walls of their flesh and living off their lifeblood. And that makes them the sole fiduciary duty of any pregnancy they carry. And I've never seen that delegated to a secular legislative body in any biblical text. <laughs> and then, at the very least, they're like, <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's, it's my religious belief versus their understanding of whatever. And at that point, you're kind of talking. And then I can go into the biology and the, you know, and the, and the law. Um, too, but, but that usually, just meeting them where they're talking, you know, mm -hmm. on that premise, I think those are the two things. I will say overall, though, that, um, you know, when I'm speaking to people in, in uh, Central and South Georgia, you know, David Perdue has already said that no matter who runs he, in, for the Democrats, that he's going to say that we're a socialist. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you, it's completely improbable that the people of Columbus, Georgia twice elected a socialist man. <laughs> <laughs> and the people of Central and South Georgia know that. And so they know that when I walk in there, um, you know, the, the Republican rule strategy has been dependent on making um, candidates from Atlanta be other. Because, you know, whatever goes on in Atlanta, I, mean, I don't know, it's just, it was probably a bunch of socialists up there, I don't know. And so they use that unfamiliarity and, and sort of wedge. Um, and it's just hard to do that with my particular political profile because I've, I've governed a community from outside of Metro Atlanta. I've lived that life as I've set forth. And so it's just really hard to make me this other thing because they're aware. But anyway, I don't want to keep you all afternoon. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you all. I'll be back.